Good morning, friends. I'm Dewey, and my Tech Talk topic for today is what's available in streaming devices. Last July, when I was invited to be a staff member at TFS, co-host Ron Brown dubbed me as the streaming senior. Interestingly, though, I've done about 40 presentations to date. Only three have been on the subject of streaming TV. With bargains galore abounding at Amazon, Walmart, and Target today and tomorrow, you know, it's prime days, I decided to revisit streaming live TV with a focus today on streaming devices. I'll plan on talking about streaming services next week. The current July issue of Consumer Reports magazine reported that they're now testing streaming media devices, giving the top score to the NVIDIA Shield TV Pro and naming the Roku Ultra 2020 as a best value choice. As an inveterate cheapskate, I admit to not having paid much attention to the NVIDIA Shield streamers. They're expenses, they're expensive, and I've been content to spend closer to 50 bucks for a Roku or a Fire TV streamer. By the way, I always choose the 4K version for a superior video quality and to future-proof my purchase. I also admit that I've long admired Apple users who unabashedly drop around $200 or so for their super elegant Apple TV streaming devices. Also, I've come recently uh, recently come to realize that NVIDIA Shield streamers are equally elegant streaming devices in the Google ecosystem. In 2021, Apple TV introduced a new 4K model with HDR and, not, and an upgraded metal-clad Siri remote that offers clear improvements in video quality and processing speed. You'll find up to 20% or more off in savings on some of these Apple TV models at prime days, or on the prime days. Regarding the NVIDIA Shield TV Pro and its less expensive sidekick, the NVIDIA Shield TV 4K HDR, I haven't yet seen any prime day discounts on these models. It might be noted that the NVIDIA Shield streamers are favored by most gamers above all other streamers. Changing the subject now, ReviewGeek.com reports that YouTube TV is offering TV TiVo Stream 4K and Chromecast devices free to selected customers. Speculation is that may have something to do with that ongoing dispute between Roku and Google. CNET.com recently published an article entitled Best Streaming Devices in 2021, in which their editors named the best streaming devices in various named categories. The best streaming unit overall was declared to be the Roku Express 4K Plus. At $40, it's $10 cheaper than the popular Roku Streaming Stick Plus 4K, I should have said, yet has comparable capabilities. The next best streamer overall, according to CNET.com, is Chromecast with Google TV. Its biggest strength, they say, is the Google Assistant voice search. Regular price is $50, but you won't find this unit at Amazon now because of the contentious relationship between Google and Amazon. It's available at stores like Target and Best Buy, and of course, from Google. It's important to understand that you can only use the new Chromecast to cast from the latest version of a Chromecast-enabled app or a Chrome browser on any device connected to the same Wi-Fi network as your Google TV. Uh, maybe read that sentence over again quickly. It's a little complex, complex. Google TV is effectively a makeover of Android TV with Google's name on it. It integrates really well with other Google services like Photos and supports nearly all major streaming apps. I'll have more information on Google TV next week. The third best streamer overall listed is the Roku Streaming Stick Plus. 4K. Though the basic design is three years old, its updated features include voice search, TV on and off, volume control, and mute. I have three of these streamers and I really like them. Amazon and other marketers currently have them on sale now for $39. It's a bargain at any price. CNET.com says the best streamer for Apple fans is 
surprise, surprise, <laughs> the Apple TV 4K 2021 version I've spoken about earlier. It's loaded with features and great for people who want to remain in the Apple ecosystem. Regular price is $199, but it's prime day price at Amazon at this writing is $170. Best for gamers is the category name CNET.com chose for the NVIDIA Shield TV Pro and less expensive NVIDIA Shield TV 4K HDR. I mentioned both earlier. The Pro model costs $50 more, but includes a game controller. For folks in the Google ecosystem, it de these devices leave little to be desired. The 4K HDR unit is pictured at the right. The best budget streamer is the Amazon Fire TV Stick Lite. Though this streaming stick lacks 4K, it does have the have voice search and other features not found on the pricier Roku Express 4K+. Plus. To its credit, the remote doesn't need line of sight to operate. In what sounds like a contrived category, best for convenience and wired streaming, it is the Roku Ultra. Though a little more spendy at $69, it has Dolby Vision, Dolby Atmos, a headphone jack, programmable shortcut keys on the remote, a remote finder, and a wired Ethernet port. Quite a unit. Designated as the best 4K streamer for Amazon fans is the very popular Amazon Fire TV Stick 4K. Like the Amazon Fire Stick Lite, it bakes Alexa right into the remote control. With a massive selection of Amazon content, as well as Dolby Vision and HDR, it remains an excellent choice. The final stream we'll look at is the Roku Stream Bar, a relatively recent Roku product. It's a 2.0 channel sound bar with side firing wide speakers and its streaming capabilities are equivalent to the Roku Streaming Stick Plus 4K. That's the one I have. It's $130 at Amazon Prime, but currently on sale for $99, and I think that's a bargain. Well, that wraps up this review of the most highly recommended streaming devices you can buy, especially on this Amazon Prime kickoff day or whenever. If you happen to be one of those rare techie type persons who hasn't yet ventured into streaming live or pre-recorded TV, I really hope you'll live it up and take the leap. Well, that's my Tech Talk story for today, and I am really sticking with it. Thanks for watching. Stay safe, and we'll see you next week. Ready to go. This is a Windows 11 preview special for Tech for Seniors. I'm Huey Poplock. On June 24th, Microsoft is having a special preview of what's next for Windows. But this past week, there have been a lot of leaks of what might be coming on June 24th, just a few days away. Let's see what is being shown as part of that leak. This is an installation of the Windows 11, or at least that's what they're calling it. It'll ask about which keyboard layout you want. Ask you if you have a second keyboard. It checks for updates. It wants to know how you want to set up the device for personal use or work or school. And then you have to sign in with your Microsoft account. It is possible to sign in without a Microsoft account, and you do it with an offline account. It then does starts the install. It asks you to create a PIN. So you set up a PIN. It says, do you want to restore from a previous version of Windows, or do you want to set up a new device? You then choose some privacy settings. This is the top of the screen, and as you scroll down, there are some more choices.
and then it wants to customize your experience by you checking off certain things that you do on the computer. Do you do gaming, creativity, family, school work? And there are some others and you can check them and it will set things up a little bit uh, uniquely to you based on what you check off in this screen. Then it asks about OneDrive and how you want to set it up. And it goes through hi, are you things are getting ready for you? It takes a few minutes. And when it's done, it looks like this. They've changed the background, the theme, and when it starts, it only has two icons on the screen, the Recycle Bin and Microsoft Edge, its browser. This is the About screen to show you that it is Windows 11 and which build it is and then the software license. This happened to be the Windows 11 Pro that was installed. Apparently there are a bunch of choices when you're doing your install. Again, this is what it looks like. You look down at the bottom, you can see the taskbar has changed. It's in the center now. However, if you're one of those people who don't like change, you can change the taskbar to be on the left with the, the newly designed start button that looks like four blocks or a w actual window uh, that will be in the left corner as it was before. When you click on the start button, you can see all apps or you may see something like this at the bottom. Uh, your search button will come up and look like this. So the search bar is not on the taskbar. Next to the search button is the new desktop. And you can have multiple desktops by pressing that button. Those you can see you can have desktop one, desktop two. So you can have different choices. And this has been in Windows 10. You can have widgets. And this is the weather widget, but there are other widgets that you can install, and that's the widget button on your taskbar. Again, any of the icons on the taskbar can be, can be removed or moved around on the taskbar. Here is the start screen, the new start screen. Notice the icons have changed. You have the pinned items at the top and then the recommended underneath. You don't have to have anything pinned if you don't want. And then you also have the All Apps button that gives you the list that you used to see on the left-hand side of your Start button. If you hold your mouse over the Maximize Minimize button, you'll have a choice on how you want to have your screen look for productivity. You can have side-by-side, side-by-side but not even. You can have two smaller windows with a larger window on the left, or you can have four small windows open. And you can set it up by clicking that, and then you click which box you want it to be, and that window will then be in that position. Here's what File Explorer looks like. It looks much the same, however, the icons have all changed. Here are your choices for the setting up of your multitasking window. Microsoft has a new storefront with a different look. You also have the ability to have a dark theme. So it's reversed. Instead of having a white background, you would have a black background. I don't prefer this. I prefer the white background. I think it's harder, number one, to see for me. And it's harder to use when you're demonstrating. There's folder options that you can change for either dark or light. And that's basically the preview that you're seeing. There's lots of videos, lots of talk about it. What are my conclusions? I personally don't think they're going to call it Windows 11. They kind of indicated that for a long time. The leaked version says Windows 11. Maybe I'm wrong, but I think they're going to call it Windows 10 21H2 and do the upgrade in the fall, or they may have it 22H1 in next spring, 
or they may give it a different name. They may just call it Windows and then call it 21H2 or 22H1. But I think they've leaked this and a lot of things have changed since that leak. But we'll see on the 24th, just a few days away. Thanks for joining. I'm Huey. It's Ron Brown with Tech for Seniors. Today we're going to talk about mopping with the BravaJet 240. Now you remember the like and subscribe. If you like this video, please click the like. And if you want to see more like this, please subscribe. Let's get on with the show. Now a goal at Tech for Seniors has always been to help seniors live independently. In order to do that though, there are four things that must occur. First of all, you must have access to health care and be able to follow it. You need to do shopping and purchase food. You might want to watch the video, Let's Go Shopping, I've done. I'll leave a link up top. Also, you'll need to be able to perform personal care and, of course, clean your own home. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Now, what are some of the obstacles to keeping your house clean? Well, obviously, there's financial. Can you afford a housekeeper? Do you want the housekeeper in your home in this time of COVID? Do you trust that extra person? Maybe we can use technology to help keep your home clean. You may have mobility issues. You may not be able to get down and get the vacuum under the bed. What about problems with your vision? If you can't see, how do you know if things are clean? That can be very difficult. And oh my gosh, if you can't remember to do things because you're having a little trouble with your memory, that also can be a barrier to keeping your house clean. So can technology provide a solution for this dilemma? And let's have a look at that today. Now in cleaning your house, there are two parts. Of course, you have carpet and you have floors which need to be vacuumed. This isn't really a video about vacuuming your home. Let's Today I want to talk about washing the floors. Difficult task if you have to get down on your knees and wash them. So let's see if technology can help us. Now the traditional way and the one that we've always done is we have a steam mop as you can see on the right side. But today I want to look at some of the technologies that are available for you that will help you do this, such as the vacuums will. Now, yes, there are vacuums, robotic vacuums that do both. They vacuum and they wash the floors. Pretty cool. But these are dual function machines and they're often very expensive. And the reason for this is they require two extra features that robotic vacuums usually don't have, and that is they need a water reservoir and then they need a mop attachment to be placed on the bottom of the machine. This adds complexity and often makes these devices over a thousand dollars. So do you have to spend all that money and does it work any better than a steam mop? Well, let's have a look at that. So the one I purchased was called the BravaJet 200 by iRobot. It was $170 US. Now, the BravaJet 200 is inexpensive, only cost $170. It has a precision spray and has three types of sweeping. It can do a wet, it can do a damp or a dry uh, sweep. And I'll explain that in just a minute. Now, where I got a lot of my information for this presentation was a YouTube site called Vacuum Wars. And this is an excellent site. They do quality testing and they test a lot of vacuums and have standardized testing. And if you are interested in this area, I would encourage you to go to that, um, to that site and I'll leave a link in the show notes. Excellent, excellent presentations. They recommended that a single purpose unit works better. And that's the way I went. Rather than getting a vacuum mopping combination, they said it's cheaper 
and they work better and they're much simpler. Now in the iRobot line, there are two models. There's the uh, M240, and that's the $170 version. That's the one that I bought. And then there's the M6, which is $450. Now, what is the difference between the two? Well, functionally, they do essentially the same thing, but the M6 has more advanced navigation. It has LiDAR and more sensors on it. For a lot of reasons that we're going to talk about, that's really not necessary. And the $170 version cleans just as well. So their recommendation was by the BravaJet 240, which I did. Now, let's look at the unit. First of all, this has a rechargeable battery, but it doesn't go back to the dock. So yes, you have to take the battery out. It clips in a charger and you charge it up. Lasts about an hour and a half, which is plenty. This unit then requires you to fill it with water. I would recommend using distilled water. It really doesn't take much water to, compl to fill it up. So uh, it's uh, distilled water would be the best. There are three cleaning pads that you can use with this mopping vacuum. On the left, you'll see what we call the wet. In the middle, you'll have the damp. And on the right side, you just have a dry duster. So on the left with the wet, there is two passes and two sprays of water. So the floor is much wetter. With the center one, there's one spray, not quite as wet, and there is no water with just the dusting. And you have your choice between these three pads. They're disposable and certainly interchangeable. Now connecting the pads is easy. Uh, there's a cardboard plate on the back of them and they are coded. So that's how the mop knows what it's going to do. And remember, you have three choices. You can use the wet mop, which of course has two passes with a spray, so it's wetter. Or you can use a damp mop. It has one pass with a spray. It's faster because it doesn't have to go over the same area twice. And then you just have the dry mop, which is like a duster. So that's easy to slide these on. They do make these in washable, reusable ones. So far, all as I have tested is the disposable, disposable ones, and they are about a dollar a piece. Let's see how easy this is. You fill it up with water, put a pad on the bottom, and carry it to the floor with the handle, closing it. One push of the button to activate it, one push of the button to start it, then pick it up when it's finished. A unique feature and one that makes this unit so successful is the vibrating head. Watch the head of the mop again as I start it and you'll be able to see the vibrating head. This makes the cleaning outstanding. So what's my experience in the past two days? Well, my wife's delighted. I'm running around cleaning the bathroom floors. She couldn't be happier. Well, the first thing is the floors must be clean of debris. Because remember, this is a mop. So it's just going to push large chunks of dirt around. So you probably should run a vacuum over the floors first. The second thing is this unit is extremely quiet. But it does take a lot of time. So in our large kitchen area, it would take about an hour to do. So it could be used very effectively running it overnight. You can't hear it. It's very, very quiet. And I think it would be a good thing. The smaller areas, such as the bathrooms, no problem. Just do it. It stops when it's finished. You can just take it and move it to another room. So it's great for bathrooms because it gets down and it cleans in smaller places. The physical size of this is actually quite a bit smaller than our iRobot vacuum. It's maybe about a half, half the size. So it gets in and around the toilet and cleans all the floor quite well. The pads, of course, are disposable. I've only tested the disposable pads but you uh, can buy reusable pads to be washed out and reused. Uh, the 
Last thing is uh, they do provide a cleaning solution. So far I've used just distilled water in mine, but I've only had it for a few days. Uh, I have cleaning solution on the way and we'll see if that makes a difference. But so far I've been very happy with using the distilled water. I think this is an inexpensive way of keeping your floors clean and certainly will help seniors stay in their homes longer. It's Ron Brown with Tech for Seniors. Remember, click the like and subscribe, and we'll see you for the next video.